Um, so uh, the title of this session is Nature Does Play Dice, and this is taken from Einstein's famous quote that said, you know, God does not play dice when he talks about quantum theory, and thanks to Vanessa for suggesting it. I think it's very catchy. Um, but as we will see, God, or rather nature, does occasionally play dice and occasionally gives us natural experiments. Um, as a way of a brief introduction, I'll just tell you my encounter with natural experiments. Um, my PhD was in causal inference, but it tended to be on the more theoretical than the applied side. And although I was familiar with instrumental variable methods, which are basically underpinning all the natural experiments that we're going to see today, I was more interested in the context of how can you identify cause and effect you know, from observational data. And that's how I encountered it. And I never really paid attention to the applied side until I started working in epidemiology. Um, and Mendelian randomization became quite a big thing with all the genome-wide scans and all that kind of thing. And Vanessa will be talking a little bit about that later as well as giving a bit of an overview, I think, of instrumental variable methods. And um, after that, I didn't think about it much. And then I started teaching a course in causal inference uh, by the MSCs at the School of Economics. And that was the first time I encountered the regression discontinuity design and encountered time series design because my predecessor had written about it in their notes. Um, and I thought it was a really fun and clever idea. And I had noticed that it wasn't really much applied in epidemiology or, or medical statistics and public health, although it was widespread and well known in econometrics and social science by that point. Um, and I then went on to do some work in the regression continuity side and design myself. Um, but Dominic, will be shortly, will be talking about the social, some social science applications, in particular uh, in the voting politics and immigration. <coughs> and I've yet to, to really see or do anything in the interpreted time series design, um, but hopefully Yanis' book here will help me, and maybe I can find some, some applications in that as well. Um, so that's really what I wanted to say. I just said I just wanted to give the motivation for the talk, for this talk, for this series of talks is that I, I, you know, I didn't know about these things, and I'm hoping that some of you are sitting on data that complies with some of the requirements of, of these data designs, and so that maybe you can go away uh, and look at your data and find that you can, you know, you can do some of this research uh, yourselves. Okay. So without further ado, Vanessa will be talking about um, denormalization and causal inference, and just quickly. About 40 minutes, five minutes for questions, but there's more question time at the end, should you want to. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation. Um, so I will be talking about some, it will be an overview work, um, overview talk, um, and it's joint work with uh, lots of people. We had, we started with the MRC project, inferring epidemiological causality using Mendelian randomization, and Tom and Shah and Roger were our postdocs there. Uh, and now um, there is a big iterative epidemiology unit in, in Bristol where a lot of this is being done and applied um, and more collaborations going on. So I will give you yeah, we go. I will give you an overview of this area of very active research. Um, we'll probably spend most of the time on the first two parts because I think uh, given the topic of uh, the theme today, um, that, that those are the most interesting aspects. Um, so Mendelian randomization is really an instrumental variable method. We look at this and it stands and falls with the assumptions, how much you believe in the assumptions. And it's therefore always a question, can we test the assumptions or can we at least do something that makes us believe them more or make them at least halfway plausible? So we will look at that. Um, so I will take you through the basic ideas by first looking at a very um, uh, prominent example. It's probably one of the uh, most successful applications <coughs> of Mendelian randomization, I would say, where we are interested in the effect of alcohol consumption on some health, health outcome, and we use a genotype um, to mimic the effect of alcohol. So obviously in epidemiology, we are typically interested in the effect of interventions, uh, public health interventions. You want to give people advice yeah. what to do and what to avoid, drink less alcohol, eat folic acid, uh, et cetera. So you, it's very much at the core of um, the research um, that you want causal relations. You don't want to give people advice to do something if it's 
only based on an association won't actually happen yet. So uh, we do want, we do have cause of questions in epidemiology because of um, the public health uh, aspect. But we also in epidemiology usually only have observational studies. A lot of the quantities of interest cannot really be randomized or um, you'd only randomize them once you have a good reason to believe that there is an effect. So uh, there are various reasons why we first of all look at observational studies. Uh, also, we want to know the effect in, in the general population and not just in a very specific population chosen for the randomized control trials. So the obvious problem will be confounding. And there are lots of methods to deal with uh, observed confounding, how to adjust for it in some clever ways, etc. But really, in the end, um, it's, it's also difficult to convince yourself that you don't have unobserved confounding left and you'd like a method that can also deal with this. So let's go to this example with the uh, alcohol consumption. So I'm going to use little DAGs, which have directed acyclic graphs like this, which have a formal definition. I'm not going to uh, talk much about how DAGs are defined, um, but there is, there is a, a math behind a graph like this. So uh, we are interested in the effect of alcohol consumption on disease. And it's quite obvious that the alcohol is confounded with lots of uh, lifestyle factors, uh, other health behaviors, etc. Um, so, and, and it would be difficult to convince yourself that you've ever measured enough and correctly and without error, etc. So, uh, it's more likely that there's some unobserved um, confounding still there. So, a particular study um, that has looked at this is this the one cited here. Um, and we have to ask ourselves what can we do in this case? So obviously, we cannot randomize alcohol consumption. Um, even if you could convince people for a small amount of time to stick to a protocol, uh, it's really also lifetime. You want to know the effect of lifetime alcohol consumption. Um, so if we can't randomize what we are interested in, then we have to see whether we can find something that's similar to randomization, so where nature has randomized. And that would be an instrumental variable. So basically, the instrumental variable is the next best thing um, when you can't randomize the actual quantity that you're interested in. And the instrumental variable will allow some inference. It's not quite as uh, powerful as an actual randomized trial, of course, but it will allow some inference about intervention even in the presence of unobserved confounding. Um, but you can't just decide how I'm going to use an instrumental variable because you have to find one where nature has provided one and um, uh, which, which um, satisfies the, uh, the assumptions that you need in order to do the inference that you want. So you have to be lucky that in a situation um, where you're interested in cause and effects that you can actually find an instrument variable. And it has been uh, very popular in the last 10 years or so to um, look for genetic variants for the kind of quantities that epidemiologists are interested in. So if it's a genetic variant, because genes are passed on according to Mendel's laws, uh, it's called Mendelian randomization, because it's trying to replace uh, something where you'd like to randomize, but you can't for practical reasons or whatever reasons. Uh, and you then use uh, the genes, which in a way have been randomly assigned according to Mendel's laws, and that replaces uh, your randomization. So in the... Um, uh, in the alcohol consumption, so that it says again in blue, if we can't randomize this, look for instances where nature has randomized through genetic variation. In the alcohol consumption, uh, such um, uh, gen uh, genetic uh, variant exists. The ALDH2 uh, gene uh, determines basically how alcohol is being um, metabolized in, in the body. And if you have the bad version of this gene, then um, you have a very strong and immediate adverse reaction to alcohol consumption. So it's not just the next day, we all have the hangover next day, but this is an immediate uh, reaction so that people who have that gene really don't, almost don't drink, very rarely, very little. Um, especially those who have uh, the homozygotes in this gene, they have this very strongly. So um, if we can argue that this uh, genotype is, uh, uh, that, that this uh, genetic variant is distributed randomly in the population, then that's like telling a random subset of our population, you can't drink. And, and people really do adhere to this because of these immediate bad reactions. 
So it's almost as good as a random sample. Of course, it doesn't mean that everyone else rings. They will, some of them will ring and some of them won't. <coughs> but we have a random sample where we kind of not disallowed ringing. Um, so if we see that these individuals have different risks, um, typically lower risks for all kinds of things, then um, Uh, then um, we have some evidence that uh, alcohol is doing something, or at least that not drinking improves uh, health. So I want to define a bit formally what I'm going to talk about, and I'm going to use um, what's called the decision theoretic approach. You have different ways of formalizing uh, causality. People often um, in the medical stats literature use potential outcomes in the artificial intelligence literature. Um, use uh, Pearl's do operator, and if you did your PhD with Philip or work with Philip, you use the uh, uh, decision theoretic approach. So here we uh, say we want to make explicit that we are looking at a different type of conditional distribution. And we are going to use an indicator sigma. So sigma, you can remember, maybe stands for strategy. So a strategy where we tell people do this. So if x is some value, then it means um, we give the advice, eat five portions of food a day or something like this, uh, and that's the, uh, the intervention that we are looking at. Or we let people do what they want, and then that's the empty set or the idle uh, indicator here, and that means uh, the uh, exposure that we are looking at uh, arises naturally. So basically, under the intervention, we fix the value of x, and that's like uh, you would do in a randomized controlled trial. You would give pe these people get the treatment and those don't get the treatment, and you can directly observe the intervention distribution. Whereas in an observational study, you're observing where this is idle, so where people choose what they do with the uh, exposure. Okay, so this, if we then look at the uh, distribution of the outcome under an intervention, that's basically like what we would observe in a randomized trial. And it is the total effect of exposure on uh, the response. It doesn't matter on which various direct or indirect pathways it works. And the usual conditional distribution, so this here, would denote we observe y given that we have observed x. So whatever way x came about, we just observe it. It came about, um, and it's basically the uh, the distinction between these two things that we mean when we say association is not causation. This, the blue thing here, describes association, and the red thing describes causation. If y depends on the value of x here, we have causation. If y depends on the value of x here, we have association. So what they are, what uh, an instrumental variable or any causal inference method should give us is if we observe this, how do we get to this? If we, basically, if our data comes from here, how do we get to this? And the um, instrumental variable does give us uh, a bit uh, in this direction. Again, I'm using the little dash to illustrate um, the assumptions. So what makes the gene, G now st stands for gene genotype, an instrumental variable for the effect of X on Y. So think of X as hyperconsumption and Y as coronary heart disease. Uh, U is the unobserved confounding. Had we observed U, we could adjust for the confounding and we could <coughs> get uh, a causally valid um, uh, inference. But we haven't, or at least not all of it. So what we require is that uh, the instrument or the genotype is independent. The symbol means independence. is independent of U uh, in the idle regime. It must not be independent of the exposure that we are interested in, because that's the thing that we want to kind of mimic the randomization of. So it would be uh, very unfortunate if they were independent and there is not, no information. And, and this is a bit, um, this is a tricky uh, assumption, it should be conditionally independent of the outcome given uh, the exposure and the unobserved confounder. So that we can't really test this because Unobserved confounders are, by definition, unobserved. What it means is that there should be no direct effect of G on Y, and there should also not be any confounding affecting 
g and y. So we have confounding affecting x and y, but we should not have any confounding affecting g and y. So ideally, we, if, if we can't randomize x, ideally we'd like to randomize g. Then we could ensure that all of these, uh, some, well, maybe not the direct effect one, there could still be a direct effect, but all the uh, absence of confounding we would ensure in that case. Um, so we really have to argue that nature randomizes the genes, which really it doesn't because you inherit your genes from your parents. Um, but as you will see, we can still argue quite well. We also make assumptions about the intervention. So in fact, uh, in order, if we want to talk about um, intervening in X, that needs to be meaningful. And if, it's, if, if you think, well, often it's not meaningful, then I'm asking you, well, what is your causal inference about? What are you trying to infer? You, uh, the, the, the clearer you can be about this, the more you can meaningfully, meaningfully talk about the assumptions and check the assumptions and convince others to believe in the assumptions. Um, so this is these assumptions here are basically saying that an intervention in X must be meaningful in the sense that we can just go and change X itself. Um, so the assumptions are equivalent to this factorization that's without the sigma here. Um, and our inference is basically saying uh, we want to think about a situation where we just exchange the distribution of X, which uh, in a randomized trial we would be able to do. We would just flip a coin for X, but in uh, uh, many situations we can't. But it's what, it's what our inference wants to be about. Uh, under the intervention, if we could randomize X, what we would see is that we would break this arrow here and we would just fix X. So that's our, what our intervention is about. Uh, so sometimes this uh, independence that we then have between G and Y, given we intervene in X, is also known as the exclusion restriction. So in some parts of the literature on instrumental variables, you see the um, assumption summarized as exclusion restriction. And uh, they don't really refer to you that. So it's a different way of phrasing the assumptions. So what can we do then with an instrument? So this is what an instrument should formally allow us to do. Uh, what can we then, what do we obtain with these assumptions? First of all, we can just check the association between the outcome and the instrument. And there should only be an association, rough if and only if, I put this in quotation mark, uh, if there is a cause and effect of X or Y. So it's a kind of replacement test. It's a bit like an in intention to treat analysis, um, where G would be the intention and Y is the outcome that you're measuring. And under the assumptions, you should only see an association if there is a cause and effect. Um, usually we want to estimate the cause and effect. So uh, without further assumptions, um, we cannot point identify the cause and effect, but we can get bounds on the cause and effect. So we can say, the co with what I have observed and with the assumptions, the cause and effect cannot be lower than this and larger than this. Uh, we have written a SATA package that does this. It only works for a few, when, when all the variables have, uh, are discrete and have few different levels, otherwise the computations become very complex and it's not feasible when you have continuous variables. And for point estimates, you need some semi-parametric for parametric uh, assumptions. Usually, people use structural equation models for example for this. Uh, so, <coughs> let's look at the uh, reasoning with the testing. So, if I assume there is no causal effect from X on Y, so I'm deleting the arrow from X to Y here, then if you're familiar with DAGs, you may rec recognize that in this DAG, G and Y are marginally independent. There is a path between them, but because the path contains a collider, it's an open path and that, uh, it's a blocked path and therefore there is uh, no association between them. So you should see this uh, in your data. If there's a causal effect of X and Y, there should be an independence between G and Y. The one reason why I'm uh, saying you need to be cautious is if you act as a weird effect modifier. So you could have an effect of X on Y, which is positive for one value of U and negative for another value of U and they just happen to cancel out. Uh, and then that messes things up. But this is 
known as a, in, in the artificial intelligence literature as something called lack of faithfulness to the graph. Uh, and it's often just assumed away. But it's um, in, in practice, um, even because you never have an infinite sample size, you have to worry about power of your test, etc. So things that come close to this kind of canceling might be a problem. But for all practical purposes, I think that when you do a Mendelian randomization analysis, you should first of all just carefully investigate the gene and outcome association and basically forget about the exposure measurement in the first place. So we're not using X at all here. So even if we've mismeasured X or if we think we haven't specified X very good, very well, it doesn't matter because we're just using the instrument and the outcome for this. And that should be our first step in the analysis. So I've already discussed the assumptions a little bit, but let's see how in practice uh, they are being justified. So with some examples and also with some examples how they are violated. Um, uh, yeah. So it's these are the assumptions again. There should be no edge between G and U. There should be no edge between G and Y. And there should be the association between G and X, which I've highlighted in red. Uh, so the association between G and X you can of course test because you have you should have measured G and X and the other two things you cannot test and you find time and again in the literature that people think they can test them but they've forgotten that they cannot condition on you so um, you, uh, you can't test them. In particular none of these conditional independencies are implied or should hold uh, by these uh, assumptions. So there's sometimes a bit of confusion in the literature. So mo mostly, the main thing is to use subject matter background knowledge and some tricks to justify these assumptions. Let's have a look. Um, so the idea is that uh, this, this first one, the, the dotted line in red with the number one is, is uh, being discussed here. Uh, the genes are randomly allocated from the parents to the child. Uh, so in a way, there is some randomization going on there. But what you've got to convince yourself of is that then the properties of the parents or the parents' genes are also not associated with the uh, unobserved lifestyles and fathers in this case. So uh, there, there is no particular reason why they should be. You could say that the parents, if the parents <coughs> already have the gene that they can't drink alcohol, then probably the child wouldn't drink alcohol very much anyway because the parents didn't do this, but that would affect their own alcohol consumption, not the other lifestyle things. So um, further, what people have done and do with this uh, example, but also with others, is that in many studies you have measured lots and lots of covariates and often they don't even get used. Um, and they have just uh, looked at association, tests of association between genotypes and all these um, uh, lifestyle covariates. And there's a, a nice overview paper here that, uh, and they haven't found any associations there. So the genes uh, in this case are not associated with all these other lifestyle factors that might be relevant. So you can, of course, test the <coughs> lack of association with observed confounders. It's still don't know, you can't, still can't test it with really unobserved ones, but at least you can convince yourself with the observed ones that it's not associated. So then the other um, uh, absence of uh, absence of a direct effect. So there, knowing the um, the chemistry of the gene helps, and it is uh, here very well known exactly what the uh, uh, biochemistry is and what it does, how it affects the metabolism of alcohol, and that it doesn't uh, shouldn't affect coronary heart disease directly. There's no particular reason or other evidence to suggest that. So, but of course, this is something that only works when you have a very well studied uh, genetic variant. And with a lot of genetic variants nowadays coming from genome-wide association studies, we might not believe, we might, it might not be so easy to convince ourselves of this assumption anymore. <clears throat> So the association between instrument and um, exposure can be studied because they are both supposed to be measured. And um, this is a plot from one of the papers, and they really should have given you the confidence intervals. But this is the uh, 
uh, alcohol consumption when for those who have two times the bad version of the gene, this is for the heterozygous, and this is for those who don't have the bad version. So you can see that is uh, an increase in alcohol consumption if you don't have these adverse reactions. Um, so now let's think in this example about just testing for a causal effect of alcohol consumption. In this case, it was sorry, it was um, coronary heart disease. Um, and there's uh, these findings reported in the paper. So we compare uh, blood pressure as a continuous measurement, for example, um, and it's uh, it's much higher for those who have the normal alcohol consumption. So this mimics large versus low alcohol consumption. And if we compare the heterozygous, then it mimics moderate versus low alcohol consumption. And even the moderate one is, um, is harmful in the analysis here. So now we come to an interesting aspect of another way how we can convince ourselves of the assumptions. Um, this uh, uh, genotype is particularly uh, prevalent in the Asian population, and this study I think was mostly done with the Japanese population. And I found in their data set that the women didn't drink at all, regardless of their genotype. So they are like a control group. So if we want to, if we go back to this assumption, if someone doubts that there might maybe be a direct effect or some other pathway between <coughs> genotype and outcome, then we should even in the women who don't drink, find an association. So this is something that they investigated. And uh, this is the meta-analysis of uh, these studies. And this is for the women. So there is no association uh, found, it being in the middle. Whereas for the men, you find the association with a bit of variation between studies. So this is another way of how we can convince ourselves, so unless there is a very strong uh, uh, sex effect on uh, what is going on, um, which is implausible, um, uh, this is uh, evidence that there is um, no other pathway between the genotype and the outcome other than through alcohol consumption. So other examples of Mendelian randomization, it has been used uh, in many contexts, and it's not just the alcohol example. Uh, so people uh, have found uh, genetic variants, for example, for fibrinogen and homocysteine, CRP, a body mass index, um, especially there's a lot of work on body mass index, and people are now using multiple instruments, lots of genetic uh, variants that predict body mass index. Uh, and um, we've given an overview, but that's already a bit old, so there are many years studies now of um, the Mendelian randomization studies here. So this was more to convince you that the um, assumptions are satisfied, but of course, as I'm sure all of you have already got some, something in your mind, but this could not work, this might not work, etc. So let's think about how they might be viable. <coughs> um, one thing to keep in mind is population stratification, because as I said, the genes are, come from the parents, um, and the parents might be from a subpopulation, especially ethnic background, etc., which often goes together with different lifestyles, especially regarding alcohol consumption, etc. So we have to worry about that because what population stratification does, um, if um, within population the allele frequencies might be different because people don't mix across populations, they stay within the population. And there, uh, there might be other reasons why the disease is maybe more prevalent or less prevalent in the populations. And then we would have this confounding here. <clears throat> now this is something that the, uh, the people uh, who use Mendelian randomization who I work with are very aware of. And you can <coughs> um, stratify by population or you can just look at one population in the first place like they did with the alcohol study. I just used the Japanese uh, uh, studies. Um, or um, what people do is they uh, use a principal component analysis to stratify by the population uh, substructure, etc. So that's already quite a lot being done to avoid this problem. Um, this is an early example for extreme to illustrate this. So uh, in this uh, 
subgroup of Native Americans, um, there was a strong inverse association between a particular haplotype and type 2 diabetes. But you also find that the prevalence is very different. So there's a haplotype prevalence 1%, type 2 diabetes of 40%, and they are Caucasian population, instead you have a haplotype prevalence 66% and type 2 diabetes 15%. So very different for these populations. And that would be exactly this, the red structure there, different uh, genotype uh, prevalence, different disease prevalences. Uh, and that could have lots of other reasons to do with the subpopulations. So of course you need to be aware of the existence of such subpopulations, but People are quite aware of this and are trying to be careful about it. Linkage disequilibrium is another um, possibility of how this could be violated. And this linkage disequilibrium means that there are other genes which are correlated with the one that you're interested in, and these other genes do other things that break the uh, uh, assumptions. So, for example, if we have, so P stands for, again, Parentage, because the association comes from uh, uh, being being passed down jointly uh, through the uh, parents. Uh, G1 and G2 would be associated, and if G2 affects other things, then G1 has an association with Y other than through X, and that should not occur. So that could uh, be a problem. So this is also something that. Uh, from the genetic point of view, knowing the genes and what exactly they do and with what genes they are linkage disequilibrium with, people do try and look at this and very check this, that they are uh, not in danger of um, violating the assumptions in this way. <clears throat> so sometimes people also worry that they might not have the causal gene for the exposure that they want. Um, that in itself is not necessarily a problem. So you could think of it as measurement error, you can think of it in different ways, but if it basically means this, so let's say G2 is the causal gene for the exposure, but what you have measured is G1, then G1 still has an association with X, uh, it's still independent of U, it's still <coughs> independent of Y, so we would still be fine in this situation. It's only if there are then also other effects uh, from the other genes. Okay, this, uh, I think this is the last topic in the possible violations, and this is a really important one nowadays because people do use more and more genes that they find from GWAS studies that are associated, and they all often find lots of them, uh, in particular body mass index. When X is body mass index, there um, are many studies that now use multiple genes. So, uh, this would be um, uh, graphically how you would show this, where here I'm drawing it so that they are independent, but G1, G2, G3 don't need to be independent, they could also be dependent. This in itself, again, would not be a problem. Each one of them individually would be a valid instrument, but you would think that you are exploiting more information if you use them jointly, so then it's an interesting methodological problem of how to use them jointly. <coughs> Um, but let me explain with, uh, with the graph also what, um, what has recently um, been investigated. If you have multiple instruments like this, you can even allow some of them to violate the conditions. So let's say you get a whole bunch, 20 genes or so from a GWAS study uh, that you find are associated with X. And now you, you think, well, not all of them will be satisfying all the instrumental variable assumptions. But you can show that certain methods still work if uh, about half of them are violating the assumptions, but the other half are valid, and you don't need to know which ones. So uh, people are looking at these kind of methods now, and that's quite an exciting area because it allows for it's, it makes it more realistic to allow for violations, um, but you also want to use multiple genes. Um, also, another thing is that you, if you use each one individually. You should all be they should all be estimating the same causal effect. So if they estimate different causal effects, the assumptions are violated, or <coughs> you might uh, actually have uh, heterogeneity in the causal effects, which is another thing that uh, is interesting to look at. 
Okay, so we use the genes to uh, check them each other, whether they um, uh, satisfy the assumptions. Uh, we might use them together to strengthen our um, analysis. And on this slide, it should say that these are the recent developments where people are uh, using things like robust regression, so things like LASSO, etc., or also uh, another method based on the idea of meta-analysis, combining all the effects you estimate from the multiple genes into one overall effect, and then uh, uh, account adjusting for the bias, a bit like you adjust for bias in the meta-analysis. And the bias would be due to violations of the assumptions. <clears throat> Uh, okay, so this was a bit about possible violations, um, and the, uh, the, the, the problem still is well, you will need to find the instruments when you want to investigate a particular cause and effect to just find the instruments that allow you this. Um, and genome-wide association studies, I was quite skeptical at some time about uh, the use of this because I thought you cannot really convince yourself of the assumptions, but with these new methods, maybe there is a bit of um, headway to be gained. <clears throat> okay, so um, maybe I'll spend just a few minutes to give you an idea of how we use instruments to estimate for the parameters. Now I'm going to skip through some slides. Don't, don't worry, I'm, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> okay, so uh, this is a slide to give you a quick idea of how a method works, which is known as the two-stage least squares, uh, which is the kind of fundamental method of using instrumental variables. Um, so, uh, in, this, in this little illustration, we have our exposure x as humans continue, <coughs> our exposure y as humans continues, uh, and let's say the unobserved confounder, uh, u1, u2, u3, is basically the three clusters, so each with uh, the three levels of a confounder. So you see that within each value of the confounder, you have a negative association. Okay, but if, because we don't observe this, we would observe it without those three labels, and we'd just put a linear regression through there, and we would get a positive association. But now let's, let's assume you have an instrument, and the instrument are the two different colors, so it has two values, so it shifts x a bit with the red ones a bit to the uh, to higher values. Okay, so that's what the instrument is doing. Uh, so this, is, this would be naively the, the positive uh, regression line between y and x. Um, and if we, what we do first is we do a regression, so this is two stage least squares, we do a regression of x on the instrument, and we do a regression of y on the instrument, and then we plot the, uh, the, the blue dots are the means, and then you take a regression through that. And that now gives you the correct negative slope. Okay, so this is a little graphical illustration for this sort of estimator. Uh, so this is just uh, the formula um, in terms of regression coefficient, regression of y on the instrument divided by regression coefficient of x on the instrument. This is the simplest possible case where everything is univariate and nicely linear, and it has lots of nice properties in the deal. It's simple in this case. It generalizes when you have uh, uh, vectors. You just do the linear regressions and plug in the predicted values, these kind of things. Um, it has, it is also quite robust. The only assumption it really needs is that in the outcome regression, so for y, given x and u, you need this additive separation in the mean uh, and the linearity in x. Uh, and what you do need also, as you can see, is that we're not dividing by zero, right? And the, bet the more away from zero we are, the better, and that's called a strong instrument then. So we want the covariance between x and g to be large compared to the covariance between y and g. So that's a strong instrument. Um, now, a bit of um, our work has gone into uh, how to do this when we have a binary outcome, because people have suggested in the binary outcome, obviously you don't want to do a linear regression, to just replace the regression coefficient by a log odds ratio, and that is actually doesn't work so well, it hasn't got nice properties, not consistent really. Um, 
So we've spent a bit of time on improving this. So the, the other slides are about uh, this, these improvements. Um, and uh, they, uh, the problem is that they start relying on um, the uh, uh, assumptions that you make about the exposure distribution. So the nice thing about two-stage these squares is that it relies <coughs> on assumptions about the outcome only, which is what we are interested in. Yeah, we wouldn't normally, if, if we just did the normal regression analysis, we would just specify the outcome distribution. <coughs> uh, but uh, other methods for more complicated situations rely on the exposure distribution. So recent um, methodological developments have been looking into uh, making, uh, finding robust um, methods that are not so um, sensitive towards assumptions in the exposure distributions, for example. So um, this brings me to the end of the talk. I just wanted to give you a bit of an outlook at the end uh, of uh, what there is to come. There are lots of other slides. Uh, I have also left slides for possible questions. But there's some summary somewhere. <laughs> no, um, I, I can't find them now. <laughs> There you go, conclusion. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. So we have some time for quick questions now. Maybe we could wait until the end. Right here, thank you, Vanessa. <laughs> and now I'd like to welcome Dominic Kahngartner from the LSC. He's going to be talking about that. I think just double click. <coughs> There's your purple slide there. Excellent. And if you want to be seen by the live stream, you have to sit down. Oh, I'm very bad at sitting okay, down. Okay, good. Then go ahead and just be a bit of body board. I think that's good. To try Is that okay? <laughs> okay. Oh. Um, I'll do my best, but. I mean, you're, you're, you're trying to make it there. No, it's just not the RDB one. Yeah, no, I was just got a different version. Okay. thinking of it. No, no, plugging in um, the clicker. That's okay. That's it. I didn't want to start YouTube. Um. Do you have one? I have to. You have to, you have to open it with um, your yeah. yeah, so. Sorry for it's that. It's completely blocked or something. But you have to like left click or right click or something to say open with. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so Here we go. Excellent. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Perfect. All right. So I understand I have like 45 minutes to talk about the regression discontinuity design. Um, let me get rid of this. Um, and I was thinking I'd structure the talk in, in two parts. Um, uh, the first part is focusing on what we will call the sharp regression discontinuity design and we'll make a couple of examples and then we hopefully also have time to talk about the so-called fuzzy regression discontinuity design which nicely ties with the things that Vanessa already mentioned so I can just you know sort of stand on the shoulder of giants here and um, show you how even with sort of an imperfect jump um, from control to treatment we can use this design to make causal inferences. And I understand that the regression discontinuity design has become very much en vogue in many social and economic sciences over the last couple of years, which you know is always a little bit surprising because it's not a new idea at all. Pistolate and Campbell came up with this idea in 1960, um, but unfortunately, many people, including me, don't really read out of our narrow disciplinary boundaries. And then it took really a couple of decades until that caught on and people understood that this is, despite the, the very particular design that we need, um, a very useful thing that we can apply more often than, than we think. And I try to convince you of that during the next 40 minutes. So the basic idea is the following, that as often in observational, i.e. non-randomized studies, Assignment to treatment and control is not random, right? But what we know in order for the RDD to work is the assignment rule that influences how people are assigned or selected into treatment or control. It's surprisingly widely applicable in a rule-based world, and I'll give you a couple of examples uh, later on. 
And under fairly weak assumptions, it has high internal validity. So it's one of the few methods that in replication studies has been showing um, to identify the, uh, the actual causal effect in a non-biased way that we would like to estimate. And I'll say more about that in a second. So here's the outline. We first talk about the, the sharp regression discontinuity design, then go on to the fuzzy regression discontinuity design. At the very end, I have one more slide about further issues right? and think, things to explore in the future. So just very briefly about identification. This is super simple, so we do, can do that quickly. Imagine we have a binary treatment to make our life as simple as possible. Um, taking on value one, if on x, which is what we call the forcing variable, if we exceed a firm threshold c, and value zero or below. And I'll make an example in a second, okay? So x is not just like a covariate here, but a very particular forcing variable that determines the value of the, your treatment, right? And these types of design often arise from administrative decisions. So, so let's look at an example in the spirit of the original example by Mr. David Campbell here. So let's assume uh, you are a university and you hand out scholarships, right? And you do so because, you know, you want to make your life simple on one single score. So let's call it the SAT score, if you will. And let's say for students who exceed a value of 2,000 on that score, they receive the scholarship, but nobody below 2,000, right? And so we have this discontinuity in the probability of receiving the treatment at 2,000, right? And the basic idea for the RDD and basically, you know, thing that I wanted to talk about for the next 40 minutes is that we compare people close to that threshold of 2,000, right? Those who just barely exceed the threshold and receive the scholarship to those that barely miss the threshold and don't receive the scholarship. And that's all there is, right? So at, you know, the threshold of, of 2,000, we have this discontinuous jump in the probability of receiving the treatment from zero to one, right? And whatever the outcome that we're interested in here, for example, it's earnings, you know, couple of years after these, these students obtained their university degree, what we might see then is uh, also a jump in, in the outcome variable, right? And clearly, you know, the SAT score down here is correlated with earnings. Students who have higher SAT scores are typically better at making a lot of money afterwards, right? And so the basic idea is that we focus our attention on those who barely receive a scholarship to those who barely miss it, right? And basically that, that jump in um, the observed outcomes at the threshold is then the causal effect of receiving the scholarship. So we can do that in the potential outcomes framework, but we don't have to use the potential outcomes framework. Um, but, but the basic assumption here we can nicely illustrate the potential outcomes framework. So what we observe for the people just below the threshold is the outcome without the scholarship, the blue line, right? What we observe for the people who receive the scholarship above 2,000 is the observed outcome, that is income, and with the scholarship. And what we want to estimate is this local average treatment effect here. And I do understand that the, in the instrumental variables framework that Vanessa was talking about, people are also using local in order to refer to, to the compliance, right? But what I mean here is local for the people close to the threshold, so close to five here or 2,000 in our SAT score example. Right? So, so in that sense, I mean local. And the only assumption that we have to make, I'll say more about that in a second, is that the two potential outcomes, both under treatment and under control, are smooth or continuous at the threshold. And, and if that's the case, the only task left, and I'll simplify here a little bit, but the only task left is that we model, you know, in a decent way, the point here of the potential outcome under control just below the threshold and just above the threshold, right? So in that sense, it's a prediction problem to the cutoff. Okay, so let's talk about identification for a second. There's, when looking at the literature, sometimes a little bit of confusion because a lot of people say that in the vicinity of the threshold, treatment is as good as randomly assigned. And to be honest, I'll make that, those statements as well. But that doesn't really say, I think it's nice for intuition, but it doesn't tell us much about what we actually need to identify the effect. The only thing we need to identify the local average treatment effect is the continuity of the two potential outcomes under treatment and under control at the threshold. Obviously, 
we'll never ever be able to test this because we don't observe the potential outcome on the treatment for those below the threshold and vice versa for, for the control units above the threshold. <coughs> but there are fortunately indirect tests. And these move is the only condition that we actually know. Yeah. OK. If that condition holds, we can approximate the cause and effect, that is the, the treatment effect for the sharp regression discontinuity design by approximating the potential outcome of the control from below and the potential outcome of the treatment from above. And right here at the threshold, this is the treatment effect that we would like to have. Okay, so let's talk about two brief examples here. First one goes back to David Lee, uh, an economist, you know sort of came into political science and answered one of like, the bigger questions that people in political science has, and it's a question about the so-called incumbency advantage. So if you're already holding office and you're really running, are your chances of ending up in office again, winning the election higher than for someone who newly comes in, right? There might be many reasons for this, because people know you already, there's less uncertainty, maybe because, you know, you can use the power of your office in order to convince people one way or another to vote for you in the next election, so this is not about the mechanism, but just the overall effect, right? And this is not easy to, to identify empirically because obviously better candidates were a, um, able to win the first election. You know, there might still be good candidates more likely to win the second election as well, right? And so what David Lee did is instead of focusing on the personal, individual level of competency advantage, looked at the party competency advantage. And here he compared, and uh, this is the vote share margin, so if it's, uh, <coughs> Positive, that means that the, the Democrats have won, the Republicans is negative. And what we see here is that if the Democrats have won narrowly in the election at time T, then they have about a 7% higher chance of winning the election at the next winning the next election T plus one. Right? And so this difference here then is what we could identify as the local incumbency advantage. Okay. And there might be also other ways to use the regression discontinuity to the design. And I understand the next speaker will talk about the temporal RDD, so I'll focus here just on the spatial RDD, basically exploiting geography so that we can also learn something about things that discontinually change at some borders, right? And what we see here um, is based on a paper by Melissa Dell, which was then published in 2010, where she was looking at the effects of the meetup, basically, you know. Uh, form of slavery system that forced people affected by that system to send, or the villages affected by this uh, system to send uh, every seventh son to work in the in the mercury or silver mine in, in Peru in the 18th century. Right? And so what you can do, because there are these discontinuous borders that only villages within the border had to send their sons <coughs> to the slavery system, but not the villages that were just outside <coughs> of the border, we can use the border as sort of the threshold here, right? And what Melissa did in her, her nice paper is that she looked at some outcomes today, like equivalent consumption and childhood stunting, and found some big differences for those villages close to the border, just within, compared to those just outside of that border, right? Clearly, one thing that is you know, more problematic or something to worry about when you use the spatial regression discontinuity design compared, say, to the SAT score from before, is that you have to be absolutely sure that there's nothing else changing at that threshold other than this meta conscription system, right? And so, for example, I grew up in a, 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 a nice small city in Switzerland, Fribourg, where there is a river dividing the German and Swiss German and French speaking parts, right? And I always thought, well, maybe we can use this discontinuity in the language to study something interesting. But of course, the issue is that many things change once you cross that river, right? People are reading different types of newspaper, eating different types of food. So, you know, you're not really know what you're estimating when, you know, you're focusing on this border. And so this is, you know, not just in this, this example from my hometown, but often an issue. So you really have to argue, you know, that everything else, then the thing that you want to study is actually constant at that border. So, um, let me talk a little bit about, about estimation. And unfortunately, it's something that we don't know very much about in the context of RDD. What we know, and what is simple, is, of course, that we somehow want to approximate, as I said, this threshold from below and above. And I can do that in a linear, with a linear model. I can do it with a quadratic or with a cubic model, or higher polynomials, if I will. 
What is more important, however, is the question of which bandwidth, which window size shall I pick to the light, right and to the left of, of, of the threshold, right? And, and obviously, the larger window that it gives us more precision, but also more bias, right? So it's a typical Hertz bias trade off, but depending on how you, you know, um, what you believe more important, that has implications in how you pick that window. <laughs> so there is a little bit of literature uh, and three suggestions how to do that. The first one is based on cross validation by Ludwig and Miller, 2007, in a nice article. But what we know from one validation study that I'll talk more about in a second, and um, most of simulation studies, that doesn't work very well in most cases. Then there is the nice Imbens and Colin Yamaran um, bandwidth selection, which is sort of mean squared error optimal under some assumptions, right? And that has been shown to work in some contexts quite well, but not in others. I'll say more about that in a second. And lastly, this is a new paper by Kolonica and Matthias Gattonetto and Rocio Titunic, which is a, a, a nice paper where they sort of try to find a bias correction method in order to recover the, 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 the unbiased right? And so these are three different methods. We don't really know which one works best. Yes, please, sir. I missed what the bandwidth is. Can you just... Yeah, sorry for that. So the basic question is, like, you know, how much of the data to the left and to the right, the, the window doesn't have to be the same size, do you want to use, right? In approximating this point here and this point here, right? The larger the window, more data you're using, higher precision, but also larger bias, right? So the basic question is, you know, how shall I pick the optimal window size? Does that? So I'm confused why you wouldn't, why you ever not want to use all the data. Well, because if you're using much more data, and, you know, that could lead to some, and you just say with linear regression through here, you know, you could have some bias here. You're not really interested in, you know, modeling the data over here very well. The only point of interest is here right at the threshold, right? And so that's why it's a little different than, you know, some other you know, specification searches. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about these, these three methods. Um, and again, as I said, we don't know very well, you know, in an in actual context, um, which one works best. Obviously, we can come up with simulation studies, but you know, with simulation studies, you can prove pretty much whatever you like, right? Give me three parameters, I'll build you an elephant, give me four, I'll make you dance, right? So, a very nice paper by five Finnish friends of mine, so I will not pronounce their names. Um, Pete Finnett et al., it's a working paper, uh, just been rejected uh, for reasons I don't understand. Um, is the following. What they do is they focus on a case where we know the experimental benchmark. So it's like the Lalonde 1986 study in spirit, but for regression discontinuity designs, right? What do they do? They focus on the incumbency advantage that I introduced before. And, but in Finnish local elections, it's proportional representations and parties have different lists with candidates, right? And you vote for the different candidates on the list. And because you know Finland is not a large country and they have many municipalities, quite often the on the same party list, two candidates have the same number of votes. Right? So what happens? Well, what happens is that they put the name into a hat. <coughs> I'm not making this up. In, into a hat, and then they draw you know the winner out of the hat, and this person then gets an office, and the other person doesn't. Right? So this really are random elections. Right? And I think this is interesting to study in its own right, but it's also great to try to validate the regression discontinuity design, right? Okay. And so this is sort of in the random election, the, the incumbency advantage that we see, it's basically a fairly precisely estimated zero, right? Independent of the specification, right? Now, um, the issue once you try to model that data is that there's quite a bit of curvature around the threshold, right? So and this refers back to, to your question from before, right? If I use a linear specification, it's hard to see in the back, but basically we estimate a treatment effect, which is the difference between this point and this point, right? So clearly non-negative, right? Um, then if you use a, a smoother specification, quadratic or cubic, what we see is that the treatment effect goes to zero, right? And so, which is then obviously consistent with the experimental benchmark here, right? So we clearly see that, you know, the way how we model that might, you know, give us a wrong estimate. 
And so then what we can do is we will use the three different methods, Ludwig Miller cross validations, IK, MSC optimal, and then the CCT bias correction to see which one performs best in this particular context, right? It's just one data point, of course, right? But at least it's a start, okay? And so, unfortunately, the, the basic answer of, of uh, my take on the results is the following, that except for the CCT bias correction, none of these methods actually work very well, unless, and that's the good news, you do some under smoothing, right? So if you choose the window size according to I and K, that's optimal for a linear model, you get a biased estimate. You find that, in other words, significant incumbency advantage, right? Because you get the curvature wrong. But if within that bandwidth choice, optimal for the linear model, you actually fit a quadratic or a polynomial model, you know, you do, you do some other smoothing, then you get back to the experimental benchmark, right? Fairly precisely estimated zero treatment effect, right? So my take home point at the moment uh, from that is that either you do the bias correction, you have to make some assumptions here as well, or you do some degree, at least one order, of, of under smoothing. And again, it's just one data point, but you know, that's what we know. <clears throat> All right? Okay. So, um, fortunately, there are more things that you can do. As I said before, we are never able to directly test the smoothness assumption at the threshold, right? We do not observe the potential outcome under control for the treated units and vice versa, right? But there are, of course, many implications, indirect tests of that assumption. And, you know, uh, I think the strength of the RDB is that it allows us to um, do these indirect tests, okay? So here's just an overview. First thing I think that's, that's useful to do is the sensitivity, similar to what we just discussed, right? Do you get very different results if you use one more polynomial, right? Um, second thing that you can do is, with the specification that you've chosen for the outcome, you can also look at some covariates not affected by the treatment. And what you don't want to find is similar jumps in those pseudo outcomes there as well, right? The third thing that you can do is that, okay, there should be a treatment effect at the threshold, but there should be zero treatment effects, you know, if you move pseudo threshold to the left and to the right, right? And of course, if you find similar jumps, you know, at minus five or plus five, that also casts some doubt about, you know, the treatment effect that you find at zero, and maybe then it's just because, of, you know, that you didn't really capture the curvature of the regression line. And the last, I think, very important test is sorting, right? And I sort of, you know, skipped over that a little bit uh, in the intro, because what we are assuming um, when we are saying that <coughs> the units are smooth at the threshold, one sort of behavioral implication of that is that the units of the analysis don't have discrete control of landing to the right or to the left of the threshold. Obviously, if I learn more, invest more in preparing for the SAT score, you know, I can push, you know, hopefully my scores, you know, up. But I don't have discrete control that, you know, if I invest like 10 minutes more, I go from 90, 1999 points to 2000, right? So what we have to assume basically, behaviorally, is the units of analysis don't have discrete control of if they want to be to the left or to the right or to the right of the threshold. Sarah, I hope you don't mind, but one, um, <laughs> one, uh, one, uh, one case that you know I, 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 I looked into and tried to analyze and then had to stop is um, uh, looking at the effect of higher salaries for Italian mayors, right? Because the maximum cap of, uh, of salaries for Italian mayors uh, changes discontinuously at some population thresholds. So if you have you know, 3,500 um, in half residents, then your maximum salary is 40% higher than the 3,499. Now, if you look at the density you know, of, of the number of people living in those villages, not surprisingly, you see a sizable jump, right? You have many more villages with just 3,500 than 3,499. You know, of course, what you do is, you know, you, 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 you call your brother and offer them some money to move to your village, right? <laughs> and everybody's better off. <laughs> Fortunately, that has testable implications, right? Because uh, without sorting, we would see no discontinuous jump in the density at the threshold, right? And 
if we are, so this is sort of the opposite of the town and mayor example, if we have unemployment benefits, you know, for people below a certain income, right, now they might make sure that, you know, they just don't reach the threshold, <coughs> and so we have more people just above, uh, just below than just above the threshold, right? But obviously there are different tests that you can do, including the McCrary test for 2008. All right, let's move on to the fuzzy regression discontinuity. So the difference between the sharp and fuzzy RDD is very simple. Um, the, the, the basic difference is the following, that you have a forcing variable like before, I said these scores, and you have a threshold like before 2000, but the probability of receiving the scholarship doesn't jump from zero to one, but say from 30 to 70 percent, because you know, you're know you not as lazy as I would be and just look at the SAT score, but you also look at, say, letters of recommendation, right? Or extracurricular activities of the student, right? So there is a discontinuous jump at the threshold, but it's not one from zero to one, right? And so in that sense, it will relate back to what Vanessa talked about, and where we use the discontinuity, the, the threshold, as an instrument, okay? So this is the, the, the thing that I'd like to talk about for now. So what we shouldn't do with this, in this fuzzy RDD world is just compare recipients with non-recipients, even close to the threshold, right? Because let's say you're focusing on two people above the threshold at 2001, right? One of them received the scholarship, the other didn't. Well, clearly there's some difference between them, right? Maybe the letters of recommendation were better for the first than the second one. Right? So you shouldn't just make um, that comparison. But what you want to do is that you want to focus on the compliers. Compliers in this framework is a student who switches from non-recipient to recipient of the scholarship when crossing the threshold. Right? That's, that's a complier in this, in this context. But you know, we don't want to focus on people who get the scholarship anyway, independent of if they are just below or just above. These are the always takers or the never takers who would be the people who wouldn't get the scholarship even if above the threshold, right? Okay, so this is sort of the, the, the graphical interpretation of the same thing, right? So what we see here is that we have an increasing probability in receiving um, the scholarship um, if your SAT scores goes up. But in addition to that, important for our purposes, we have a discontinuous jump in the probability basically from, you know, 40 to 60 percent, right? And so we are using that now as an instrument. Um, we can similarly define the local average treatment effect. This is the differences in observed outcome, which is not the same as the difference in the potential outcomes. Why? Because we have to scale it by the proportion of people uh, that, that only receive the scholarship if they move from below to above. That is the proportion of compliance. Okay. In terms of identification assumptions, fortunately, I can uh, uh, mention what uh, Vanessa already said earlier today. So you need a binary instrument. You restrict your sample only to those close to the threshold, you know, and the optimal window is, again, something that, that we will have to discuss. And you need to invoke the usual IV assumptions, right? So ignorability, first stage one, ethnicity, all the things that you already mentioned in your talk. If these assumption holds, then what we can do is that we can identify the cause and effect very local now. It's the effect at the threshold for the compliers, right, between the two potential outcomes by, on the one hand, approximating the differences in the observed outcomes divided by the differences in the probability of receiving the treatment, right? Or in other words, you divide, it's the world estimator here, is the outcome discontinuity by the treatment discontinuity. Okay. And the way to do this is you use simple, the simple world estimator, fixed two-stage least squares um, regression. You can add um, polynomials to do a little more flexible specification, but again, what's on the debate is, you know, what's the optimal bandwidth that you want to go to the left and to the right. And I also think it's usually very helpful to separately plot the estimates of the outcome and the treatment discontinuity. Okay, 
So let's make an example. Um, and it's uh, an example from my own research where I've been interested for quite a, interested for quite a while in <coughs> <for> citizenship <laughs> on immigrant immigration. And the policy debate, and I don't want to bore you with the details, but it's basically on one hand those who argue that we should give citizenship to people fairly early on, so not having too high residency um, criteria because receiving the host country's passport catalyzes in a causal way the, for the integration of immigrants, right? And you have, on the other hand, in the Swiss context, that's the Swiss People's Party, who make a very different argument and say, no, if you hand out the Swiss passport too early, you destroy all incentives for these people to integrate, right? Because receiving the passport in itself has very little effect, if any, right? But it's sort of the bonus you get at the end of the successful integration, right? And obviously, if, if that hypothesis is true, then there is, no, there is very little reason to handing out you know, the passport early on. In, in, in the residency period, but what we should do is making it very difficult for people to receive the passport, right? Okay, so to study that empirically is unfortunately not trivial, right? It's very obvious that it would involve some comparison of naturalized to non-naturalized immigrants, but once we think about it, it becomes <coughs> quite clear that there's sort of a, what we call double selection bias going on, right? On the one hand, we have many applicants, unfortunately here in in black, I should change that, uh, who don't have the motivation, don't have the resources to apply for citizenship, right? Maybe they fulfill, they don't fulfill the eligibility criteria, right? On the other hand, in red here, we have people who have the motivation, resources to apply, but at some point during the application process or the screening interview, they are screened out and rejected for citizenship, right? And in many countries, this happens quite often. And lastly, we have the people in green who have the motivation and resources to apply and to successfully navigate the, the application procedure. And so a comparison between the naturalized and non-naturalized would really be sort of the average comparisons that we don't want to make because a lot of these factors that are different between the naturalized and non-naturalized are also influencing you know, integration down the line. Right? Okay, so fortunately what we can do is that we focus on a strange institution in Switzerland where people in municipalities, voters, vote on each individual citizenship request, okay? And so we focus on those who just barely win and barely lose this election. How does that work? So it's basically four to six weeks prior to the vote, a resume with the applicant characteristics is sent out to all voters in those municipalities. It's very detailed here, it's in, in Swiss term, but we have this woman from uh, southern Italy, from Sicily, and we know when she was born, her marital status, her um, employment um, history, her education, and we know when she moved to Switzerland and into this particular municipality, and lastly, we have from some stylized facts from her last tax record, including income and wealth. Right? And so with that information at their disposal, then people vote yes or no on these naturalization requests. And if you have 50% or more of the yes votes, you immediately receive citizenship. And you know, if you have 49% or less, you don't. Right? And so clearly what we want to do is focus on those who barely win or barely lose these elections. Right? Okay. So what we had to do um, is that we had to figure out which municipalities use that system of voting on naturalizations. Uh, extracted the resumes from, from the municipal archives, then but based on these resumes we have people's address and name back then, and then about 15 years later we called them up and subjected them to an interview to assess their social and political integration. Right? And there is one reason why this is a fuzzy regression discontinuity design, and the reason is that you can reapply if you reject it. Right? And some of you might like to hear that in 2003, the Swiss Supreme Court stepped in and decided that these types of naturalization referendums are unconstitutional, right? For, you know, fairly obvious reasons, <laughs> risk of discrimination, and so on and so forth. They had to change the system, but under the new system, it was much easier to apply. Meaning, a lot of the people who were barely rejected reapplied at the time of the interview successfully for citizenship, right? So among those who in their first assessment, uh, in, in, in the first application had just 50% of the zero years, right? 50% yes votes, all of them obviously had still had the Swiss passport, right? But even among those who were barely rejected by the time of the interview, about two thirds already had Swiss citizenship. So this is a fairly fuzzy regression discontinuity design. And what we are using here is the threshold as the instrument, right? And because it's one side of non-compliance, right, <coughs> the non-compliance on this side, 
It also means that the local average treatment effect that we're estimating here has one particular uh, interpretation that goes back to the Bloom result in 1984. It's the average treatment effect for the untreated. So how much would this guy here do better if they would have been you know, given the Swiss passport in the first naturalization event? Okay? And so I will not bother you with the details about you know, how we measure social integration. Not, you know, that's a big debate. But we ask you questions like, do you plan to stay in Switzerland? Or do you think once you know, you're retired, you go back to Italy or Turkey or wherever? And um, do you feel like you're discriminated against? Right? Um, are you parts of social clubs? How many? Right? Um, uh, are you reading like Swiss newspapers or exclusively Turkish newspapers? You know, so a battery of questions, and then we did a principal component analysis and extracted the first uh, principal component from that. You know, and so this is the intention to treat effect um, on the outcome. And what we see here is that the variance in this so-called uh, this constructed social integration scale is about 0.5. So we see a sizable jump here. Um, this doesn't say much about the statistical significance in the social integration for those who were barely accepted in the first referendum compared to those that were barely rejected, right? And we have to scale up this difference, of course, by the proportion of compliers that I've showed you before here, to 0.3, right? So that we see that if you do that calculation, we see that people who were barely rejected in their first naturalization referendum, if accepted, would perform better on the social integration scale by about one standard deviation, right, 15 years later. So, very briefly, further issues. I think one of, in addition to the bandwidth choice, the big open question is if we can do a little better in terms of external validity than just saying this is a very local average treatment effect <coughs> right at the threshold, right? Clearly, if we want to extrapolate away from the threshold, we will have to make additional assumptions, right? So that's very clear. And there's been a little bit of research um, recently by Angrist and, and, and his PhD student that's still unpublished as of now, but they basically use covariate information to inform us a little bit about how strong the assumption needs to be in order to extrapolate away from the threshold, right? And so hopefully, you know, with some better methods and a little bit more covariate information, we cannot only learn something about the people right here at the threshold, but also the people, you know, that are a little bit to the left <coughs> or a little bit to the right. So that's not just this dichotomized dichotomous high internal but extremely low external validity. Thank you so much. Any questions for the mic? Um, I have a question. So you, you um, nicely emphasize the smoothness assumption. Yeah. Uh, and I was wondering whether there are uh, situations where the threshold is actually there for a reason because maybe in the medical context also because they think yes. there isn't, it's not smooth. They, yeah. People really benefit more of treatment if they're this side than that side. Yeah, exactly. And, and how, the, how would that be a problem? Yes, so, so it depends. But I think what, one way to, to, to think about that is people just above the threshold are doing much worse than people just <coughs> below the threshold, right? That, that's sort of the... The, the underlying idea. Um, and then obviously the potential outcomes are not smooth, right? Mm -hmm. Because with or without treatment, you know, you would expect a drop in quality of life or whatever you're measuring right there, right there at the threshold, right? So that would be a violation of the smoothness or continuity, continuity assumption. Mm -hmm. now, are people trying to detect that or is there some way of knowing? Yes. So, so there are some methods um, uh, that now sort of uh, get more and more fancy, but that doesn't mean that they are new, right? Um, which try to uh, answer a related question um, to yours, namely, um, if there are these threshold effects, but we don't know where they are exactly, right? Can we detect them, right? And so, of course, you know, things like reversible jump, MCMC, and all these other algorithms, which are good at these tasks could be used for that, right? Um, and one applied paper, which I think is very nice, studies 
white flight uh, in the US. So basically, you know, white people who at a certain point, um, uh, there is a lot of um, immigration from uh, African Americans start moving away, right? And so what they try to find is these sort of thresholds, you know, when there is white flight is happening, right? And this is sort of an RDD, but with unknown thresholds, right? And so the task is, of course, that we have at the same time to estimate where is the location of, of this continuity and what is the size of the chunk. 